Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 510, featuring an interview with the greatest strategy guide author of all time, Mr. Bart Farkas. Now Bart's done over a hundred of these, and you probably have a few on your shelf, uh, uh, Diablo 2, uh, Starcraft, uh, I even got the one for the, <laughs> the Brood War here. <laughs> uh, if you've ever bought a strategy guide, there's a pretty good chance it was written by Mr. Farkas. Uh, now, in this interview, we talk about many things, uh, not just strategy guides. There's a lot of stuff around <laughs> the strategy guide industry uh, that you probably don't know about, but it's really, really interesting stuff. And we also talk about uh, technical writing and a bunch of other topics, so uh, a lot of good stuff. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Bart Fargus. That we're good. So, yeah, Bart. Yeah, I've just been flipping oh. through a few, uh, few of the classics here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Starcraft, yeah, guys. Starcraft, of course, Diablo 2 made the uh, my desktop background. I got a couple here. I got a whole little library. I mean, you're, I got yeah. a whole little shelf for you, Bart. <laughs> I've got, uh, let's see, I've got some interesting. Um, you got over 100 of them, I suppose. Yeah, but the, the ones that sold a lot, like these ones. Not exactly sure what language this is, but I get the oh, no. you know, they were translated into like 15 or 20 languages, some of them. So this is uh I want to say this is probably Czech. <laughs> on the... Yeah. That's cool. You know. I was just thinking that these uh really these strategy guides are collectors' items in their own right. You know, a lot of people would buy the game. They might have a copy of the box somewhere, but do they have the 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 strategy guide too? Well, I, think this adds I so mean, much. I would have thought they were garbage, but <laughs> <laughs> it is actually. I just had the uh, ability. There was a guy on uh, YouTube who just recently went through the StarCraft expansion book. Uh, it took about half an hour and went through it to see how accurate it was and how it stands up today and. Remarkably, it still stands up, which is probably blind luck because, it, I mean, I, I wrote that when the game was in alpha and beta long before it came out. That stuff works. I mean, I write books. By the time I write about a game, it's I don't have to worry about them patching it or making any updates. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that must have been, yeah, you know, what is what was the lead time on these? A couple of, couple of months? Um it, it depends on the book. So I, I did write sort of all of Blizzard's guides because uh, Bill Roper, I think, liked me. Um, so I wrote all their guides for about 10 years. And with Blizzard, they they took a fair amount of care. So I it would probably be a couple of months with Blizzard's guides. And I had to go there. So I'm, I live in Canada. I'd fly to L.A. or san fran blizzard north or south at the time and um hope the publisher picked up the tab on that huh? yeah they did yeah so so I, i'd fly down there and just uh, basically i would sit in the testing department and have my own rig and i would just play the game and just learn as much as i could and and write it there i had to do it there so it was a challenge because uh you know the the uh, but I had the access to all the testers, so I mean, and and other people at at Blizzard who had been playing the game for a year, in its various iterations, right? So, yeah, I was thinking you've got this really unique perspective, you know, historically because you were there working with the developers and yeah, sort of in between them and the gamers, and you know, you must have been privy to all sorts of great conversations about you know what they thought. Yeah. About. For sure. I mean, like, so at the time I was working at Blizzard, uh, this would be sort of, I don't know, probably 90, 90, like StarCraft was the first Blizzard book I wrote. So uh, 98 to 2008. 
I, I worked a little bit on uh, the World of Warcraft one, but that was sort of before the book, <clears throat> before that project got going. So it was about 10 years that I did all their books. And uh, yeah, remind me again what your question was, because I, <laughs> I was thinking, was thinking about, about this unique position you had, because you weren't really oh, yeah. one of the developers per se, but you had this all this insider knowledge, because of course, yeah, so yeah, I'm, I apologize. I just, I got, I got thinking about uh, World of Warcraft for a second there. Um, yeah, so yeah. What, what was cool is to see how Blizzard made games. So at that time, um, I saw, so over the decade, I saw a number of games that Blizzard had gone quite far down the path on that like nobody ever knew existed. They just, this isn't good enough and they just killed it. Wow. And they also, at the time, this is pre-Activision, um they just waited until the game was ready and perfectly balanced balancing their games was so important and i think that's why games like warcraft starcraft diablo one and two were such huge hits right because they're they're super well balanced it's so replayable mm -hmm. and uh oh, well. and that they just i don't know i actually don't know anything but like about their financial situation or but they, at the time, they didn't have the corporate pressure to hit a release date. So if they had to push it, they would. And if they didn't like the way a game development was going, they would just kill it. I can think of three in particular um, that just, yeah. And they, they probably made the right decision on those two. So. Those strategy games? Or... One was the game. Is it like, the... not allowed to talk about it sort of things? Is it? um one was a, a, a space kind of like uh galactic exploration kind of a game mm -hmm. another one was like a third person shooter kind of futuristic third person shooter kind of a game the other so, one i can't talk that's about the way to all. prototype something to get make all the progress on it and then it has to yeah, yeah i mean i had a lot of respect for them because so i i, I mean i got to work I mean, I worked on site at Rockstar and Nintendo of America and lo lots of different places. I didn't always work on site, but I, I got the opportunity to travel a lot and be on site. And uh, it was interesting seeing the sort of philosophical differences between the, the developers. Was there one that you felt more comfortable in or was it all about uh, the same, just different or was there? I like Blizzard because I had friends, like I made friends with the guys and, and I was... I went back for like you know again and again and again and so it was comfortable there and they they you know trusted me and i had a key to the building <laughs> you have to have a pretty good relationship with them i think because you probably always needed to go to them and ask well how about this and you know yeah yeah i have this part right and so on and so forth yeah for sure and that's i mean it's stressful i mean when i when i did uh i remember writing starcraft i basically now, so what I heard was that Bill wasn't that happy. Bill Roper wasn't that happy with the previous guide that had been done. So at the time, I guess I had written enough of the guides to get the honor to do, you know, StarCraft. And of course, nobody knew StarCraft was going to be so huge. And so I uh, I wrote the book and well, I was on site writing the book. And then Bill would want to review things every, you know, every few chapters, he'd want to go over them and. There weren't a ton of changes, but he 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 wanted to keep an eye on it. And then after after that book, he trusted me. Yeah, that's so super cool that he put you know he, he cared about it that much. You know, wanting it to you know just, you know what you say is a historical role. I was thinking about the games industry as a whole and where these game guides fit into that ecosystem. Well, I mean, I think they were. Uh, I know that they they were kind of. They were sold as part of the game almost, right? So the important thing about uh, writing one of these guys is it had to be done several weeks before the game was actually finished, like ready to ship, so that it could be printed. Because printing took a couple weeks. It had to be printed and then rushed, and it had to be on the shelf next to the game the day the game came out. If you didn't have that, you'd lose 50% of the sales. Pressure. So it's kind of part of the percent of the cells. 
Yeah, I guess people, when they went back in the day, right, like in the 90s and in the first decade of the 2000s, they'd go to, was it EB or GameStop or whatever, you know, Best Buy or wherever they were going, and these things would be on the shelf beside each other. And people say, oh, I might as well get the guide while, while I'm buying the game kind of thing. Um, I know for me it was kind of almost a marketing thing because I would – you know, you wouldn't have a whole lot of screenshots and things of a game, but if you had the game guide there, you could flip through it and get a pretty good idea what the game was about, you know, whether you should buy the game or not. So it was kind yeah. of a, it was almost like a marketing. I just wondered if that was, maybe that's just a coincidence or <laughs> was that part of the plan? Like why they wanted the I mean, guys to it, look so good? It could be from the, from the standpoint of the, the game publisher. Um, I think, the game publisher wanted, I mean, the game publisher would have a, a piece of the guide and and the the book publisher would, would have to pay a, a, a fee. So, so for example, uh, StarCraft, maybe they had to pay $100,000 for the rights to have the official guide. Like the book publisher would have to pay $100,000. I don't know what it was. I'm guessing it could have been half a million. Um, and then both the book publisher and Blizzard would make a percentage of all the books sold. So there's like a mutual, you know, uh, reason for, for the quality to be as high as possible. And uh, yeah, and then of course, but so the next book after that was probably, after StarCraft expansion, I think the next book was uh, Diablo 2. And I, I'm pretty sure it was half a million for the rights to that official guide and so and so that's the difference between an official guide and an unofficial guide or unauthorized yeah, i think probably the authorized ones make a lot more money i would guess right because it's the authorized or maybe well the- so you're supposed to i mean normally normally you would get help from the from the game publisher not always i mean a, a constant frustration of mine was that you know you'd be on site working for a game company we'd have the license and you'd ask for cheat codes right because cheat codes when you're writing a book uh you often have to write these things in two or three weeks that's you know, insane very, very short amount of time so you're working 16 hours a day um and if it's uh like a, a playstation game or something like that then you're, you're taking like a thousand screenshots hmm. it, you know with you know, trying to get the highest quality you can, because of course back then, televisions were what uh, 320 by 240, right? They're very low resolution. So to get a screenshot that looked okay in a guide was hard. Um, you know, did they give you equipment to do that with, or were you using a camera? No, no. Um, I had, I had. Uh, what I would do is use the highest quality cables I could out of like if it was a PlayStation, like so I would take the highest resolution out of the PlayStation, which would be 480p or 720. I, I don't remember actually anymore. And and I would actually put it on high eight digital tape. So I'd play the game and record on high eight digital tape. And then I had multiple computers. I had a Mac at the time that had a like a coax in or something. So you could run TV through your Mac. And I would run that signal out of the high eight tape digital tape deck it was like a camcorder basically i'd run it out into the mac and then get the you know maximum resolution on the screen and capture screenshots that way and that actually was uh one of the best ways to get like a video game computers are always easy because you can screenshot stuff right it's high resolution but the the uh console stuff is a real real challenge and then the other challenge was sometimes if you're writing console games um you would get a japanese version of the game and so you'd need a playstation that was c- capable of playing in the japanese format uh, what's it called the region code or whatever and and so you had to i i had to spend a lot of money to get the hardware to be able to write some of these because we're just hired guns right we i worked for prima and brady games and cybex and you know microsoft yes so do they give you just a fee or are you paid by the hour or 
How did that part work? Well, <laughs> so you get paid, you you get paid by the book. Um, in the beginning with Prima, like, so Starcraft, I I don't know. It probably the book probably sold a couple million copies. Um, I think my royalties were three percent. I think I got about ten thousand dollars. So basically, they. Prima at the time was an independent company. It's owned by uh, Random House now. Random House is a much better company that follows rules. Prima, I would get royalty statements that would say that they'd given me 185,000 author copies. So author copies, they don't have to pay royalties on. So they would put hundreds of thousands of sales into that category so they wouldn't have to pay me royalties on it. And the problem was that if you push back on them, they would blacklist you. And so, and there's, cause there's only a couple book publishers doing strat guides. So if that's what you were doing, you know, it's kind of, it's like any business, right? People sell their mother for a thousand bucks. Sounds kind of cutthroat. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, that said, I was, I was well paid. So if it took me three weeks to write a book, you know, my hourly rate was high. Like if you broke it down that way, it would be, I don't know. It, it ranged greatly, but it could be anywhere between sort of, eight and twenty five thousand dollars for a book so it's not like i wasn't paid well so don't you know i just royalties i feel like you earned every penny <laughs> they got every penny. it's hard they got their money's worth that's for sure because you know i just thinking in my head of how long it, even with the cheat code you know even with that it must have taken a long time to play especially these long games you know you get all the way through to get to the parts that you needed to grab the shots you know and then to do the write-up yeah, the particularly like uh, I did two official guides for Nintendo. Well, more than that, but two I'm thinking of the Ocarina of Time and uh, Majora's Mask. They're just through. Uh, uh, and those were, I want to say they're on the N64. Maybe one of them was GameCube. It was around that time they were transitioning. But I had to do those like on site in Redmond. Washington at Nintendo's offices, which is a really cool place, by the way. They have a little museum there. Um, but that was hard because you're just you're working 20 hours that you have so many, you have X number of days to get everything you need. So you you have to beat the game. And in, in those situations, like at Nintendo, we just got the game. There's no cheat codes or anything. Ooh. <laughs> so back back to cheat codes. It's there's too much information in my head. I'm sorry, man. Um so I would ask for cheat codes and they they wouldn't want to give them, right? They say, no, you should be able to beat it on your own or no, we don't want the cheat codes getting out into the internet right away so that people play the game and enjoy it. And so they would bar me from getting cheat codes, which makes it very easy to move around the game and capture the screenshots you need, yeah. right? And so they wouldn't let me have them uh, a number of times. Companies would do this and then... Like a day after the game came out, the cheat sheets were on the internet. Like the cheat codes were on the internet <laughs> every time. And it was. Crazy. I mean, they, so they told you, well, you should be able to beat it. I mean, well, that's a weird attitude, I think. I mean, you're. Uh, well, you're it's. Guy, you're not just a, a guy having fun. I think it's a disconnect between. Uh, so I know that the contracts with the book publisher would have outlined that. They would have delineated that, you know. The writer gets everything he wants or she wants to to uh to write it but then what what you're dealing with usually as a producer who is trying to protect you know his or her baby and and um sometimes you'd have to get the companies involved you know to actually read the contract so that you could get what you needed i mean generally it's quite good there were there were a couple of nightmare scenarios for sure over the years where it was very hard to to get what you needed and and not just cheat codes stats right some of these games are very stat heavy like um i know when 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 that youtube review of a uh, starcraft book uh happened they looked at the various stats for the different units um and the, the some of the comments were noting that the stats were wrong well, yeah, because that was written three weeks before they did the final balancing, right? So, of course, they're going to be wrong, and they just never—the publisher never fixed them. 
subsequently. Yeah, it's almost like some of these are games frozen in time. You know, it's, it just says somebody likes the history of it. I kind of like that idea that I can go back and see what a game looked like, you know, when it was released uh, versus yeah, all yeah. these patches and mods. And I just, you know, uh, did you, did you, was it fun at all? I mean, was it just you're, you're there, you're crunching, and you got to get through the game as quick as possible? I mean, did you have any time to actually enjoy these games? So, sometimes I, I, intensely enjoyed Diablo and, and and StarCraft. And I knew StarCraft was going to be a great game. Mm-hmm. Like, it was just the story was so... Like, at that time, so in 1998, maybe it was even 97 that I was there working out, like late 97. Um, just the whole... Uh, what's her name? She's an, a Terran who becomes a Zerg. I can't remember. One of the one of the main characters in the game, like it's just kind of a twist um that happens in it. And that kind of thing. Sarah Kerrigan. Yeah, right. So yeah. Uh that was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun um hanging out with the with the crew that uh tested and, and built the game too. Because like I said, I made friendships. So those those times were fun. Times when the, uh, the publisher would need a book in two weeks because somebody else had failed to do it and I had to start from scratch. It was stressful. <laughs> De- definitely. Because you just imagine like, so... I can easily imagine. I mean, just, just do the math on it, right? So let's say it's a, a PlayStation game and there's a thousand screens in it. So the time it takes, like excluding the time it takes to capture the screen... The time it takes to write in the text, figure one, and a caption it, and then actually just label that screenshot, figure one, you think, okay, well, it's only, you know, it takes, that takes a minute and a half, but that's, you know, 1500 minutes. <laughs> to, just for that. I don't that know how you got it done. I'm just. Yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah it was, uh, I don't know either, actually, sometimes I wonder, but. Uh, somehow, I mean, I mean, uh, the publisher had editors, and uh, which that's an interesting thing. Is uh, I mean, one of the questions you sent ahead of time was talking about like why game guides don't sort of exist as much anymore. And I think, I mean, the internet squeezed them out, right? Um, but you could see it happening over time. So after we got into the two thousands, um, instead of having a, a a copy editor and a content editor and a dedicated person to do maps and you know like four people supporting you uh by the time it was 2005 it was one person wow that's you were doing everything yourself you were doing the maps yourself you were um yeah they they just uh and it was it was just a a squeeze right because the it was a very hit driven business so the starcrafts and diablos and i don't know Metal Gear Solids of the world, those guides sold hundreds of thousands or millions of copies, and that paid for all the other guides. And so, a big my understanding is that like a a, a publisher that had like a couple uh, like game publisher that had twenty titles that it would put out in a year, let's say ten because that's more realistic. Like a big game publisher puts out ten titles. Well, one of them's a hit. That's the one that. The, the, the publisher wants to write about. And so they might pay half a million dollars for the rights to that. But part of the deal is they've also got to write strat guides for the other nine games wow. that aren't going to sell as well. And those were sort of, you know, sort of, it's, it's like Hollywood in that regard. Like it's hit driven. So I have to shut my window. They decided to mow right when I'm talking to you. So. <laughs> I don't even hear anything. I should probably back up a little bit. We did. We wanted to ask what got you into this. I've got. I went to your LinkedIn page, and it's a very nice LinkedIn page. Oh, uh, nice. I think it says your background is a registered nurse. Yeah, how crazy is that, right? Critical care nursing. Oh, I, I was a trauma ICU nurse. Um, how did you make that transition? Well, that's uh, how do I boil that down? So I. So this is way, way back. You you may not be old enough to remember. <laughs> so before the internet, there were services like 
uh, Delphi and Genie. Oh, I remember him. Yeah. And, and uh, I got, I was working as a nurse, as an ICU nurse, and I was on Genie, and I got hired as like a forum leader to talk about games and stuff. And then I wrote some articles for free and stuff on Genie, did some work there, and then a service called, I want to say it was called Soft Disk or something. And they they mailed out a disc of games every month to people. And um, they asked me to write gaming articles and they, they paid me like 500 US a month, which was an insane amount of money at that time. Yeah. And then through that and Genie, I met a guy named Chris Breen who is big in the Mac community. He wrote for, for Mac World Magazine for a long time. And I pitched, I had an idea to do a, a book about gaming on the Mac, like Mac Games Bible kind of thing. And uh, he he thought it was a good idea. We took it to the publisher and the publisher bought it immediately. And the money I got from that was like more than half of what I make in a year as a nurse. So I just quit nursing straight up and started writing books. And so we wrote that book, which wasn't particularly successful. And then somebody at Prima noticed me and and it's because they're looking for guy, people to write strat guides and and the, the key really is can you can you play the game are you reasonably coherent as a writer and will you finish the job can you meet a deadline and so i i could do all those things and so i started working for prima originally and i was very quickly sort of doing eight or ten books a year yeah, and I did that for her. Yeah, the first one you did for them. Yeah, it was. Uh, do you mind if I oh. get your back and look? Let me see if I have it here. You have all your books. Uh, not all of them here because I've moved. There's some of them are in boxes still, but there is. Uh, oh damn it! Uh, it was. I don't have it here. Damn it! I have a copy of it somewhere. It was. Um, Oh, here it is. Uh, although this is not an English version, it was, it was Wing Commander Four. Oh, Wing Commander. Uh, what language is this? It looks like it's probably Portuguese. Yeah. Anyhow, I don't know why I don't have the English version, but yeah, it's a great game. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun, and that was like one of the totally unauthorized. So you'll, you used to see strategy guides that said, you know, completely unauthorized would be a big splash on it, right, or a burst. Yeah. And uh, the truth was that they had to say that so they wouldn't get sued, right? Uh, and there's nothing unauthorized or special about it. It was just some guy in a room writing a guide. It was a way to. It was a way to kind of parasitically make money off of <laughs> a, a big game. Yeah, sometimes running run into issues similar to that when they'll they'll say, well do you have the uh the copyright or the whatever the permissions to use these screenshots and things and yeah. You know, I hope that's not a deal because the publisher, the game's publisher, what if they say no you can't use any screenshots from our game? Yeah. None of the stuff would ever get written. So yeah, that's for sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, they would have teams of lawyers working on that. Just to, how do they get around so they could write write an unauthorized book, right? And and it it the book very clearly says like, hey, there's no inside information here. But they word it in such a way that it seems like it's like a wink wink. <laughs> That's pretty clever. Yeah, Matt was wondering if uh, the other Matt, my uh, producer assistant, mm -hmm. Matt. If you had done an official guide and an unauthorized guide for the same game. So I was, uh, I guess I can tell the story now. So I wrote uh, uh, Flight Simulator, Microsoft Flight Simulator. Microsoft hired me to write that because Microsoft Flight Simulator X, I guess, was, was that year. And... Uh, they hired me and they paid me a great flat rate. It was great. Microsoft was awesome. And um, 
I was a pilot, like just like a you know, flying little Cessnas around at the time. Not a super an experienced actual, pilot. actual pilot. Yeah, but oh, you know, I, I was like a low level pilot, single engine. I didn't have any. That's multi, I didn't have a multi engine rating or anything, but I understood the concepts and I could fly. So um, I uh, I was working on the Microsoft book, and I had done I had worked on a couple unofficial guides for flight simulators in the past and i won't say which company one of the companies one of the basically three strat guide companies came to me and said hey we need you to write the unofficial guide we'll pay you we'll pay you this much and we'll just keep it secret we know you're writing the original guide or the official guide i should say and um and i mean like I have some like honor, right, and loyalty. So I'm like, I'm under like, you know, my contract with Microsoft says I cannot do this, and it's not cool anyway. And um, so I refused, and they were very upset. And that company blacklisted me for almost ten years. Jeez. Just just as punishment for not writing that book for them. No, no, dude. There's a whole clandestine side of this. <laughs> <laughs> business well you know there might be a briefcase uh, on the desk you know might be might be full of hundred dollar bills you know yeah <laughs> if it's gone when i come back from the bathroom no problem <laughs> wow so that was i mean disappointing although i did end up working for that company again so well, i know there's a lot of money i remember talking to some of the some of the folks that worked on those old sierra adventure games and i've talked to even the infocom guys and the some of the Lucasfilm, you know, those adventure game publishers. And I remember more than once said that they made more money from selling their official guide or hint books, you know, back in visit clues, that sort of thing, than they did from the sales of the that game. Right. And the reason was that for that was, though, that everybody was just pirating the game. Uh, but they oh, had to go that, yeah, game. especially Infocom, right? That happened a lot. I still have my uh, Leather Goddesses of Pho Phobos. Uh, scratch and sniff i still have it <laughs> and from the original like that was like i don't know 82 yeah. maybe like it was a long I, I would be the kid probably when i had it when i bought it but yeah game or the the do you have the invisi clues <laughs> uh, the the I'm game inspired I, by like the other the goddesses of Phobos. yeah did you uh, were you inspired by some of those early clue books that you were looking at or <laughs> no I don't think so, actually, but yeah. I remember that there wasn't like a highlighter or something you had to use. That's before. right. Yeah. And physically, yeah. I mean, I never, I actually never super duper got into text, text adventure, adventures. Like I, I played Leather Goddesses. I played Zork. Maybe several of the Zorks. Uh, but I never, I never, I, I found myself getting frustrated with them pretty quickly, I think. I just I wonder how they made that decision to stop doing it all in house and to like start working with publishers on that because it you know, it seemed like a big part of the revenue. Um, I think it's I think it's just money because the logistics of publishing a book like you know so the actually the most so let's say that you're going to print twenty thousand copies of this book right this Wing Commander book. Like, if I ask you, like, what's the most expensive part of the process of this, of, of making this book? Assuming there's no license, right? Is it the author? Is it the editors? Or is it the building you're in? It's actually the paper is the most expensive part. So that's why they always wanted to print in volume and go for games that they knew they were going to sell enough of. Or books, you know, games that would sell enough. Because I think the attachment rate was generally around 10%, 10 to 15%. So if somebody who bought the game had a sort of one in 10 to one in seven chance of buying the guide with it. If I remember, I mean, this is what the business people at the public, at the book publishers used to tell me back in the day. I'd probably know if anybody did. I... <laughs> Well, let's see. We, well, we talked a little bit about Nintendo already, but uh, Matt wasn't wondering about that. What it was like working there, and the launch on those launch titles, Shadows of the Empire. Oh, Shadows! 
this is 1964 we're talking about here. Yeah, so Shadows of the Empire. That's it's a kind of a cool story. So I I got the the job to do that book. I must have been with Prima. I don't remember who who I did it with. Uh, because I, I remember where I was living at the time. Um because I mean this is now like that's man, that's gotta be 30 years ago. But um yeah, 1996. I yeah, was about right when the book came out. Right in time for Christmas, looks like. I'm just looking at the Amazon screen. Here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 96 sounds right. It was one of the earlier books I'd written, and it was a Lucas Arts game. And uh, at that point, I had already been doing it lo- enough to know that um, I often got called to work on site. And I was just like, so wanted to go to LucasArts, right? I wanted to go to Skywalker Ranch and and uh, that was not in the cart. So what they did is they, they were very worried about people cloning games and the game getting out uh, illegally. So they sent me a Nintendo 64 that what, had a, uh, a metal cage welded around it. Like, <laughs> obviously like hand welded. Wow. And then it had, it had uh, four or five tamper-proof seals on it with the game in it. And I called it sort of the game in the Iron Mask at the time. <laughs> the game in the Iron Mask. <laughs> and it was it was like an N64, and it came as one thing. And is like FedEx delivered it, and it was like, and that was their way of protecting, the, which, and it worked. But, I mean, I wouldn't, I would never attempt to steal the rom anyway but um that was it was a really fun game you knew it was going to be a hit because the the ice what are they called snow speeders or whatever taking down the walkers with the yeah, um, thanks a lot of fun well i can't get that image out of my head the game and the iron mask <laughs> No, I, <laughs> about so I, looking, I took a picture of it at some point and it's in a box somewhere with a thousand other like physical pictures back when pictures had to be developed that's how long ago this was like well, really guess, digital you know, cameras didn't really exist i mean i guess there probably was at least millions of dollars on the line in those those cases and maybe they had dealt- shadows of the empire so so the story i heard about that do you know anything about the genesis of that game i don't know nothing so so my my what I was told, and it could be apocryphal, so feel free to ignore me. But uh, I was told that basically the snow speeder, the part of the game that's the most fun, which is you know putting a harpoon on a walker and flying around and making a trip, uh, that part of the game was actually just a demo um, that had been made, and it was so good. I think they had showed it at E three, and it was just so compelling that they decided to make a game out of it. So if you play Shadows of the Empire today, you'll notice that it's got this great opening part with the snow speeders and, and just great action and uh, and physics. And, uh, and then it turns into kind of like a very average first-person, third-person shooter because you're following behind, around, behind a character. So... Um, and so you could kind of see when you look at it in retrospect, in hindsight, that they obviously thought, well, this is really cool, but they didn't have, you know, they just wanted to make a game out of it. So they kind of tacked things, tacked it on at the end. Huh. Still, it's a great game. I, I People still speak of that, fondly of that game. They sort of make a tech demo and then it ends up becoming a game, but not enough game in and yeah. of itself. So needed to add on some, hmm. Well, back back when E three, I don't know, does E three still happen uh, in person anymore? Really? Uh, I used to E three. I go to uh, some of the game dub stuff or GDC sometimes. Yeah, I I used to go to E three every year, right? Because that was my business is writing strat guides and and I would assume E3. you had a big booth there with all your books and and people the, sign, the, publisher, sign the publishers out. did. Yeah, the publishers would have a booth, and you were required, I think, to spend a certain amount of time there. Um, you've got enough of these books probably by that time people would be asking for your autograph and know your yeah, name it's very that's something I enjoy 
<laughs> very weird. The one time we were in, I was in Vegas and somebody had a, one of my books in, in a restaurant and came up to me and asked me for an autograph, which I, I mean, I was happy to do, but it, it just, uh, you know, I'm just, right. a, I'm just a guy like, come on, like there's no, because at E3, you get like kind of like fanboys and girls really excited to meet you. And I'm like, eh, I'm just a person. <laughs> I, I didn't particularly like the attention that much, but there's a tiny bit of that. Not really. I mean, you know, but there was a little bit of that. It was fun to meet people who uh, it's fun to see when you're when your book actually helped somebody or they thought it was good. So this Starcraft in particular, uh, like to have this guy on YouTube go through the book 25 years later and say, you know, he was pretty right. Hmm. It's, it's a good book still, you know, that that kind of makes me feel good. It, it makes me feel good that somebody would even look at it because I debated whether even to keep copies of these books. Oh, this. They're they're of a time and place, I but I guess collectibles, like I say, I got you know quite a few of just three of yours, you know. But yeah, every time I see these, somewhere I always pick them up just because. Yeah, well, and they're cheap too, right? But for, like for every, it's, I mean, who doesn't want to flip through and you get instant nostalgia? <laughs> like, oh yeah, that character. <laughs> oh yeah, these stats. Oh, I remember these trees. You know, I mean, for every. For every StarCraft, there was probably like, yeah. What's your <laughs> least favorite? There's book? probably like four of these. So, uh, Batman: Rise of Sin Tzu. This one, this one's in color, actually. Oh, nice. This one, uh, Metroid Prime. Yeah, I've got that oh, one. So I, I uh, honestly, man, I have no memory of even writing this book. But what like I, I did like 122 or something. So wow. uh and it's I mean I'm in my fifties now. It's been a long time. Like it's been like I would have written this one in I don't know, it doesn't have a date on it. And it sounds like you didn't get a lot of say over which books you worked on. This one's twenty one years old. <laughs> <laughs> um I did. I got, I got a little say. Usually they would just ask me, hey, do you want to do this book or would you like to do this book? Um, I got a lot of the strategy kind of real-time strategy because of, of my work on StarCraft. But I also got lots of other stuff. I mean, probably the worst one I ever did. Do you want to know? Uh, <laughs> I don't think I have it here. There was a probably around, I got to think of the year now. It'd probably be around 2008. There was a, a game, like a reimagining of Frogger. Do you, do you remember Frogger? Oh, of course. Like from the arcades. And uh, this game was so hard that I, I couldn't beat it. I didn't have cheat codes. I couldn't beat it. It was It was too hard. And so I actually brought in two other people who were gaming experts and they couldn't beat it either. And it was just, there was so little support. Uh, we got the book done. It was accurate, but man, it was so hard to do. Like it was, and, and the game wasn't, you know, maybe the funnest. Hmm. Frogger. <laughs> Yeah, I, was, I guess if somebody has written so many of these books, you probably have a good eye uh, or a good uh, set of criteria, I guess, for determining what makes a good game good. You yeah. Know, you look mean, at something you're like this is crappily done. <laughs> How do you do you have some like criteria that you would use to evaluate a game guide? A game guide? Yeah. Um. Probably. Well, because I'm a writer, like okay, maybe we could put it this way: what what separates a good one from a really great one? Um, a really well, a really great one would have a a, a a a good writer and a and a solid partnership with the with the development studio, so that it really is a game guide. Like it it has the cheat codes, it has information about secret levels and that kind of thing. Secret. That reminds me, uh, since you have a Diablo thing behind you, from my point of view, um, 
<laughs> yeah, so Diablo 2, have you played this game? Of course, yeah. Yeah, so you're familiar with the cow level? Oh, the cow level, yes. So I so I was there, this is before obviously before the game came out in Irvine, California, at the what was then the Blizzard offices. I don't know where they are now. Um but I got into the cow level and played it, and I was the first person to unlock it outside of the company because of the game had been released. So that's my like that's my real claim to fame is I'm the first person to play the cow level. I wonder if they, do they mention that on the Wikipedia page for it? That's seemed like a good. Oh man, I don't know. And the wasn't uh, wasn't Diablo the two the game with the gem that you little gem in the middle of the panel. And then you'd, you'd click it, and it would say "gem activated," and that was uh, just uh, it was just kind of a. Can I swear in this podcast? <laughs> you need to. <laughs> well, it's just it was it was like a, just a mind fuck that Bill Roper put in. I think like he basically said, "Let's put something in where if you click on it, it makes a noise and says gem activated or gem deactivated, and <laughs> see what happens." Because people were claiming that they were getting more better drops if the gem was activated or not. And it was just a meaningless toggle that he, I don't know if it was Bill or if it was uh, one of the other developers put it in kind of as a. Just a massive pick. Kind of. Yeah. A, yeah. Yeah. There's your emergent gameplay. Yeah. yeah. I think you did, uh, you worked with uh, on Playboy the Mansion. Right. There's really another case of. Brenda Romero on the show before she talked to I guess it was Brett Wait at that time. You weren't with no. her on that? No, I didn't. Well, I don't I don't remember. No. Um I the but Playboy that was another one where I was kind of hoping at the time, because I was probably in my late twenties. I really wanted to go to the mansion. <laughs> you know, uh I think I have that one here somewhere. That was a that was a weird one. I was asked if I wanted to. I remember the publisher asked me if I wanted if I was willing to write for it because they considered it more risque material or something, which I don't think it was at all. I guess just the Playboy, you know, magazine connection. Yeah, I don't think it was really that uh, X rated. No, no more than The Sims would be. I don't even know. Did you have to be like show ID to buy the game? I don't even remember. I don't know. See, it's very few games that I bought after I wrote the book for it. You probably uh, stuck up it by that point. <laughs> Starcraft, Starcraft. Uh, there's, there's a few. Um, see, I didn't write the game for like. I didn't write the guide for like Bioshock or. Doom three, or, or maybe I did. Maybe I did an unofficial Doom book. Now that I think about it, but there, there's certain certain uh, games that I would buy the game for, even after I'd played it. Like if I thought it was good enough, but not too many because you're you're done, right? Like I, especially being that I was always playing a new game, I was always writing a new book. Sometimes I'd have two or three books on the go at once in various stages of development. It was. Uh, I'm not sure it was great for my health, man. Honestly, <laughs> to it. That seems but, to know. be the way with so many things. You know, if you're doing it for fun, you know that's one thing. But as soon as there's a paycheck and you, you know, you're like, you have to do this. It yeah. just sucks all the the pleasure out of whatever. I mean, that's why I, <laughs> I'm a, a college professor, and I used to have students watch movies. You know, for project. You know, but, uh, mm -hmm. I, I quit doing that just because I. Or at least when I pick a movie, I try not to pick one I actually like myself because I know I'll probably never want to watch it again. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, it, it takes all the. I don't know why that is. What's your what kind of professor are you? I I think I looked this up already, but I can't remember. I was, I was going to get into it a little bit just because your work's so relevant to the stuff I do, but uh, I'm an English professor, but most of the classes I teach are something to do with technical writing, or I'm really more into the business professional writing side of it. Yeah, but we have a class, a couple classes where you know, of course, I let the students pick what they want to work on 
as long as it has some kind of instructional value. So yeah. inevitably there's, there's many that, that do these game guides, hmm? you know, cause it's a fun topic. I always think it's really great because, you know, they get the fun of talking about their favorite game and they get to apply those skills we've been learning about in class. But yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, <laughs> that's kind of what I was getting at with those criteria, you know, <laughs> like what would you, uh, you know, advise somebody that's like, you know, I want to do a game guide never done one before i really like this game you know but what are the one of the common mistakes i guess or what would be the good um kind of choose your voice and stick with it right How, however you want that to be don't use passive voice so here's the thing these books like some of the books you look at that are 30 years old i mean i'm a much better writer now so when i look at some what i wrote 30 years ago, I cringe a bit, you know, like, I don't know if you ever look back at your thesis or something and think, Ooh, I would do that differently. Now. I, I do have those moments where I, cause, cause currently I actually, I'm a technical writer. I work for electronic arts. So, I mean, I'm not, my <laughs> job is completely technical writing. It's yeah. What kind of stuff are you doing? <laughs> I work, I can't tell you too much, but cause I'm not allowed to, but I, uh, I work with Frostbite. So Frostbite is their gaming engine that that runs Battlefield and Madden and FIFA Soccer and quite a few of their games run using the Frostbite engine. It's a proprietary engine that only EA and EA Studios use. And I work um, to document and help onboarding and and understanding of that engine within your organization. You're writing, I guess, more for programmers and technical types. Uh, and artists, technical artists, uh, content creators. Yeah. Oh, okay. So there is so, a still strong need for that ability to take this really dense technical, complex information and right. distill it, I guess. for the Yeah, that's harder than people think. <laughs> it is. There's actually, uh, for whatever reason right now, there is a shortage of technical writers. Um. I don't know why, but I, I always know when there is a shortage because I recruiters phone me and not just me, my, my coworkers who are technical writers get phone calls, you know? Um, so it's very, the technical writing is very cyclical, but, uh, and you have to be prepared to tell your students that they have to be prepared to answer the same question a million times. What's a technical writer? Yeah, I get the, you know, I get the English, typical English major, you know, it's, oh, I want to be a creative writer. <clears throat> so they know what that is. But, uh, have you ever considered technical writing? Mm. Awkward silence. <laughs> you can make a lot more, you, you can make more consistent cool writing. Stuff you can do, I mean, technical writing is it's not all boring, you know. It's not. My my job at EA, I can't tell yeah, you much you, about it, but it's, it's really great. It's so interesting, like so interesting. And the writing is cool. Like, um, and I mean, I, I write, I've written quite a few, um, uh, intrigue romance novels and horror short stories over the years that I published under different names. So, um, so I, 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 you know, I, I like creative writing. It's so much harder. Creative writing is just so hard because you're creating everything out of whole cloth. It's, mm -hmm. it's more fun in a lot of ways, but man. It's hard. <laughs> I don't know. Do you write creatively yourself? You know, off and on. I'm yeah. Trying to get a game project off the ground. So I've been doing a little writing yeah. on that. But, you know, I think pretty much all English majors start off. You know, who, who doesn't have a novel manuscript in the, <laughs> yeah. the desk? You know, that sort of thing. But, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's hard to do. But, you know, then even if you manage to complete it, you know, trying to find a publisher and get a career off the ground is something. And you need an agent. That, huh? I mean, agents are, you know, not always honorable to put that way. I've had I've had several agents over the years. So. Some are okay, some aren't. I mean, probably the biggest knock I have against agents is some agents don't want to do anything for the money. Yeah. Well, they want the fifteen percent of everything you make, but they don't want to actually advocate for you or do anything to. Yeah, that's my experience. You know, I want to have to go out and get my own, you know, get my own uh, 
submit, you know, so submit something, get it accepted, you know, and do all that sort of work myself. And then they want to come in and get a cut. I'm like, well, maybe if you can negotiate the contract more to cover that, maybe. Yeah, but, exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, why am I giving you 15%? You didn't even do anything on this. And yeah. It sounds like you've had similar. It's a lot of money. I, I, uh, yeah, I had one contract that was, uh, I mean, it was a big contract for a book. It was like 35,000 us and, and it was just, I mean, I would have got that with or without the agent. And so, I don't know, it's 15% of 35,000, like $5,500 or whatever, just poof, you know, for doing nothing, you know. And what you want is you want you want uh, an agent who's going to make sure that the contract favors you and, and, and protects you in such a way that they're not going to tell you you're getting 185,000 author copies. <laughs> I think, I'm pretty sure I would have remembered a delivery of 185,000 books. Jeez, I just yeah. that is pretty common. Um, the guys that actually benefited, the reason why they started doing that is because of Rick Barba and Russell De Maria, because those guys wrote Miss, and Miss was a huge success, and they had to pay those guys. I know what Rick got paid; it was a lot. He made a lot of revenue off that book. And uh, so Russell would have made the same amount. And um, I think at the time, the owner was privately owned by one guy. The owner of Prima decided, I'm not paying these authors this much anymore. And so that's when they started to get creative with their accounting. After I, that. I had Russell on this show not too long ago. You, you know him, right? I, I met him at E3 once. I Rick Bar like his, the guy he wrote Mist with, Rick Barba, is somebody I know much better uh i'm sure i i did meet russell at e3 one year yeah he was so he is he was already established when i started so i would have started writing game guides probably 96 or 95 or 6 and uh he was already he already had a number of titles out there what's he doing now anyway he's just enjoying his life he's uh, uh what's it's not uh not yoga. What's that thing? It's kind of similar to yoga, a little bit of martial arts. Mm. Tai Chi, I think. Is that oh right? yeah, Tai Chi. Yeah, I think he's really into that. Yeah, cool. <laughs> it looks cool. I mean, I don't know anything about it, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I was. I guess uh, when you were working on all these game guides, it, you know, some of the ones I've looked at, I would say that there is definitely a creative writing element to it you know they'll try to get into like the voice and the style yeah. and they have like a you know a bit of a uh, i'm kind of struggling to, to articulate what i'm trying to say but you know uh, the, so almost a quasi-fictional quality to the game guide so there was a couple that i had to do uh, <clears throat> where they wanted me to kind of write some fiction and i i look at those books kind of as failures they're kind of lame but what i really did enjoy is like i did the first two call of duties mm -hmm. and uh i really enjoyed like because so put yourself in my shoes imagine you've been you've done by the time i got call of duty i had done 20 of them or 30 of them and it's depending on the it's repetitive right and so you're you're saying okay you got to do this this is what's in this level this is the boss whatever um but you kind of um you kind of lost my This is so. This is the problem, Matt. Is that when we're talking about these things, and I'm talking, I'm talking about thinking about all the. I haven't thought about some of these things in a long time. So then I start thinking about a particular game or a particular scenario. So what was I talking about? Uh, Call of Duty, and I guess you had to do oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. a creative spin on it or something. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. Yeah, so Call of Duty, um, it was... I've only written 100 of these. <laughs> it's so hard to I would not be able to keep... I, I'm, I would have... I'm, I've forgotten way more than you ever... I usually have to pick the book up, right, in my hand. So here's a Call of Duty I did, Finest Hour. Um, but I really enjoyed, like, so... So I, I would put in, like, quotes from actual people. Mm -hmm. from actual soldiers and then i i broke down every gun where it was made who made the gun um 
what its fire rate was, that kind of stuff. And that actually is as mundane as that sounds was kind of refreshing to to uh, actually have some hard hard data and it, it was kind of interesting. I'm not I'm a Canadian, so I'm not in the guns, but um, you know, you know, I found it interesting to learn about all the guns in the game and and like how they're made and and how effective they were in the battlefield, and then write about that. Well, so some, kind of learn some real life history. Yeah, I was kind of I kind of enjoyed that part, and uh, like I said, the few times I had to actually write, like pretend to be, there was a Star Trek book I did where I uh, I don't know I pretend to be like Captain Kirk's uncle or something, and write, you know, I, I didn't I didn't think it was very good, but you wouldn't do it again. Sounds like. Well, me, I'd probably be better at it now because I've written a lot more fiction since then. But even so, I don't think it's. I don't think it's necessary for a guide. A guide serves one purpose. People don't read them cover to cover. This is my philosophy. They don't read them cover to cover, cover to cover. They they want what they want. So you break the book up into places so that they can go right to the thing they need. Buy in the table of contents or whatever and get it. Uh, I guess to kind of you know, sort of wrap things up here, we, we I still have a couple of things I wanted to talk about. Yeah, sure. One for sure is what happened to the, if anything, you know, I get to see what you think about this, but as the, there began to be more and more web resources, walkthroughs online, YouTube videos, you know, this sort of thing. Uh, do you think that damaged the industry for printed books or are there people that still yeah. like to have the paper? There are people that like to have the paper, but not enough to sustain it. So it, I think print guides are still created after well yeah but there's only a couple people writing them now um you couldn't it'd be really hard to make a living like you used to be able to so back in the day you could you know all it takes is one person on, on the planet who is hyper focused on that game who knows a lot about it and dedicated their life to it to write a guide online mm. to to you know, any print guide is always going to be out of date. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast, right? For the moment it's printed, it's out of date. Because especially today where patches, like patching games and stuff didn't happen so much. Steam didn't exist, right? And and people didn't, digital downloads didn't exist at the time. It was, it all Everything came on CD or floppy disk before that. And so I th I think just the, it's just like, you gotta either embrace change or or, or die. It kind of makes me sad, you know. <laughs> it is sad. I, I mean, there's it was, yeah, it was you know, it's more convenient to go to a website or whatever. But you know. I like books. I like real books. I mean, I collect old books. I have a first edition and David Copperfield sitting right there. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, but. Um, just think about it like in terms of young people especially aspirations i mean if you want to be an author you know i remember how excited i was when i got my first book published and mm -hmm. it was printed it, it felt like well i've done something <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, it's an achievement whereas if it had been just an ebook or something you know even if it had sold a bunch more copies or something i still think i would have somewhere would have been disappointed well there's there's so so when, when you've written as many books as me, and I, I wrote, like, I think you noticed that I wrote, like, non, I wrote some, I don't know, how to turn your computer into a home stereo kind of th books and those kind of things. Um, and then I wrote fiction. And it's great when you get your box of books and you open it up and there's a physical book. That's a good feeling, especially your first one or two. You're really proud of it. It's dedicated to your kids or your wife or something, right? Um but then it's kind of like, like, especially with game guides, I always just kind of thought, well, it's something I did. I still have, I think I have one of every book that I wrote just to have. And uh, I think, yeah, it's something I did. That's great. Um, but it's, you know, they're of a time and place. And I never, I never expected the interest that's happened. Like just in the last two months, I've had five people reach out to me to interview me about 
a particular game or game guides in general. Um, because there is this resurgence, this nostalgia about games. So I guess people who are now sort of in their 30s or early 40s are thinking about games they played when they were kids, right? So it's cool, though. It makes me feel good that somebody still, yeah. even if only one of the 122 books, somebody thinks is good, that's a win. Yeah, I always think anybody like sure. me that loves these games and has got a decent collection of box copies and things of that sort. I mean, I oh. would be shocked if they didn't have at least a couple of your books <laughs> you know, to go along with these things. It, it's very common for me uh, when someone asked me what I used to do for them to say that they have a copy, especially Diablo or Starcraft. Mm -hmm. Very, very common, especially, especially in the, they started selling uh, Blizzard started selling those battle chests and they included like a miniature version of the book. Um, and so a lot of people had those. So yeah, I just noticed in this copy here, it's, it's got a thing that says not for resale on it. I don't know if that's, maybe this was bundled with something at some point. Might've been, it might've been bundled. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just, just one other thing. I was just kind of maybe a little bit off topic. I don't know. It's kind of relevant, but I was wanting to see what you thought about the uh, all this talk about the AIs and the Chat GPTs and all this stuff. Because through the grapevine, what I've heard is that there are people that are taking books and feeding them through the Chat GPT, yeah. uh, so-called workbook, uh, which is really just a you know, it's not direct. I guess you can't, I don't know. I guess it's not really plagiarism in the sense of copy and pasting, you know, rewords things and all that sort. But I mean, it just seems like a, I don't know what to, it doesn't sound like a very positive, at least from an author's point of view or publisher's point of view. But are, are you talking about fiction? Uh, no, in this case, it was nonfiction, but right. I don't know how it would work with fiction. I don't know how it works. So we, uh, what can I discuss? I have, uh, I'm just thinking like somebody makes a walkthrough, they put all that effort into it, you know, just like one of these books here. And then uh, within a, a few minutes, somebody's run this chat GPT program on it. And yeah. So, I mean, I think it's the, the way of the future. My understanding is that a lot of companies are going down that route. Mm -hmm. Using well, you you, just a while ago that there's this like the shortage of technical writers, right? So it's kind of natural. Yeah. Thing. But here, here's the thing. Like, so what I do I'm working on new features in the gaming engine, mostly. And nobody's written anything about that. So ChatGPT is useless if there's no right. reservoir of information to pull from. So until AI can think and, and, and actually use, like, go in and use, like, if you're writing about Unreal, like the, the actual gaming engine, the Unreal editor, you'd have to be able to understand how that editor works, go in, move your mouse around create things um capture images of those things uh ai probably will get there based on the advancements we've seen but I, like at this point in time i'm not too worried i think i think for sort of if you in terms of tech of writing up there's a lot of tech of writing jobs that are just like standard operating procedure stuff and mm -hmm. policies and and uh procedures and, and that kind of stuff there is a risk there that if you had a if you had five technical writers doing that for a large company that you'd only need one who would who would use a ai to rewrite the documents and then just finesse them after that's a risk but i mean why, why should i tell students and they're like well i would go into this but i'm i don't want to get i don't want to go into a field where i might be replaced by a you know, you know there's enough there's enough work out there. Is there a way like, to like protect yourself, position yourself somehow so that you're position yourself so you're doing something proprietary that isn't out there in the in the so case in point. Um I just got a job offer for a contract to work at a mine in the Arctic, writing okay. all of their procedures, some of their manuals, and it was a fly in, fly out job. Oh. Now I'm a full time employee at EA, so I'm not and I'm an old man. So I'm not doing that. But, you know, 10 years ago, I might have, right? Um, but that's a job where AI is not going to be able to do that job. They're setting up a new mine that 
I don't know, diamonds or something. I don't know what it is, but it's it's in the Arctic. And, and uh, that would pay a lot of money. And there's no way I, AI could do it because everything is unique, right? And so that I would go to industries like that, um, engineering, that kind of stuff where, you know, because the the people that write the software or or the engineers that develop the product are notoriously bad at writing. Usually, I mean, you do need technical writers there. Um, Not always, of course. Some are great writers, but you know, and there is like like today, right? Today, uh, actually, basically, the last three years, there has been a high demand for technical writers, and I, I know this because the people I work with are technical writers, and we all talk about. How often we're recruited, and and my LinkedIn clearly says I'm a full time employee, um, right. and I am getting recruited like not for side gigs but to jump ship. So a lot of that um, has to do with just being having that reputation, like you said, getting things done. Because <laughs> you know how many right. people have blues, you know, can't seem to get to that finish line and blow past the deadline. So that so that's my advice to your students if they uh, right and you, this is probably advice you give them but make the deadline make your deadlines. I think. Uh, Just, would you like to hop on a plane and fly to the Arctic? <laughs> that would probably be a pretty good sales pitch for. Well, I don't know. I guess it, I mean we're in Minnesota, so I don't know how different it is. <laughs> it's beautiful country, but not in the winter. Um, I mean. I but the think thing cool like being in the Arctic. I mean, just so you could say, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be any colder than Minnesota on a bad day in the winter, probably. Probably not. Well, no, you know, like so we're in Celsius. So I, uh, let's see. I used to we were in grade three when Canada switched to metrics. So where I was in grade three, so I could still kind of think in Fahrenheit. So you know, it might be, uh, you know, minus twenty five Fahrenheit. Yeah, it gets that cold you here. Took the yuck duck in the, and then might it might be that cold in Minneapolis, right? Or Minnesota, you said? Yeah, Minnesota. Yeah. I'm about an hour north of uh, Minneapolis. And, okay. and we definitely get our share of 30, 40 below days. Not yeah. usually, you usually get a couple of those per year, but I, I guess it's probably a little more prolonged. Have you guys had a lot of smoke there, by the way? Uh, yeah, pretty good bit. Yeah. Because, I mean, Man, I'm, what they I'm in Alberta. Air uh, warning days or air, something like that. Oh, we so uh between May 8th and three days ago, we didn't have a single day without smoke. Mm. We could not open our windows. It smelled like a campfire outside, like a huge percentage of Canada is on fire. <laughs> like it's it's I've never seen anything like it. Like it's absolutely insane. And it hasn't rained here. Like I live. Uh, east of the Rockies, right? So I'm between Calgary and Banff. I don't know if you know anything about Canada. So I keep meaning to go there just because that's just a little bit north. I could probably be there in a couple hours. So I, I'm about 45 minutes from the Rockies, which are, you know, they're like they are in, you know, Colorado, like they're huge mountains. And um, so I'm just, I'm on the west side of the country, but I mean, Vancouver, which is on the West Coast, it's about a 12 or 14 hour drive from here, or you can fly in one hour. So, because you're driving through mountains, so the flight's only an hour. But that's a, that's one of the problems, like the U.S., Canada is huge. There's a lot of ground to cover. So, you, but, still, fly, uh, you still fly or you still got your pilot's license? And... I don't. Um, it, you know, well, here's what happened. Do you, do you have kids? Mm -mm. Well, good for you, because I would own my own private island if I didn't have kids. I had four kids, and it just got too expensive to fly, because you have to rent the plane and the fuels more than the plane rental. And I can't even imagine what the fuel would be now. So if you're flying a Cessna 172, which is a common kind of single-engine plane, um, and you flew for an hour, it'd easily be 150 bucks in the 90s for the fuel. And it would be triple that now, right? So the yeah. fuel's, fuel's more expensive in Canada, too. Because Special we airplane fuels. Yeah, they, yeah, it's a, uh, I what it is. Super Double A, aviation something, fuel, yeah. 
So yeah, that's a little bit of flying with the ultra. He likes the ultra lights. <laughs> Brave man. Yeah. That's uh, I, I, you know, you don't need a license to fly an ultralight. I don't think, do you? No. I think yeah, if it's heavy enough, you have to have a license. I think yeah. it doesn't have that issue. I mean, it was fine. You're never, you're never as focused as when you're trying to land a plane. Like, you just, it's the most focused I feel I've ever been is landing a plane. Anytime I landed a plane. Because you just, if you, if you screw it up, you're going to die. Hmm. Probably. It's way easier to take off. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty scary, but I guess, yeah, that would definitely, if, if that won't focus your attention, I don't know what will. You, yeah. you probably don't have to tell too many pilots, you know, don't be uh, texting while landing. Well, I remember uh, they put a heart monitor on a 747 pilot, and, you know, his average heart rate was like 75 or 72 or something. And when he landed, it was like 145. And it was not a stressful land, it was just a standard landing. But you're they're just, it's so heightened, you know. Because that's where everything can go wrong. But um, it was fun. I, I enjoyed flying, but it was quite expensive. And uh, having kids, it, w it was expensive. So it was like I had to make a choice. Like, do I want to, where do I want? I, I chose to travel more instead. So I traveled. Are your kids really into games? Yeah, um, two of them are, especially my sons. I have two two girls and two boys. My son, my one son is in sound engineering uh, for games, like game sound engineering at Vancouver Film School, and um, which it turns out is a prestigious school. Who knew? It's like Kevin Smith went there, and a bunch of famous people went to that school. And uh, my other son, he's got an honors degree in math, but he he's really into retro games. So he likes the, he's got an old Nintendo and so he'd be, it was fun because he'd be playing these games, right? As a, as sort of like a 14 or 15 year old. And I would see him playing a game on a Nintendo or I don't know, maybe a N64 or something. And I would be like, oh yeah, I wrote the book for that. <laughs> you know? Or he discovered oh, yeah, it. Yeah, I know you wrote the book. <laughs> more often, more often, he would discover I wrote the book, and then he'd be like, "Wait, you wrote the book for this?" Because you know he was kind of into retro games at the time, and he loved them. And then he was so impressed that I had written the book. Yeah. It was one of the few perks, right? Of <laughs> doing all that. You ever get calls from people? You, you probably did back in the day, like, "Hey, I can't get past this thing." Or I, yeah, so I think people would email me sometimes. I never, no, my number was never out there, but. <laughs> um, glad for I, that <laughs> i would get emails and i mean there was a, I, I think there the one time in particular i remember getting a lot of correspondence around that was because the whatever game i was working on and i i honestly don't remember what it was they changed it between the time the guide oh, was written that must have been really annoying when that happened yeah but it's not i mean what are you gonna do like you just have to accept it when you're because you know when you're writing it that and it depended like companies like like blizzard and nintendo they'd make a real effort to make sure things harmonized well so there wasn't too much of that going on but there were other companies that were and not really not the publisher the game publisher but the development studio would make a decision at the last second or something like four days before that went to the CDs to be pressed to go in the boxes. They would change something fundamental. And you know, what are you gonna do? I've heard Even that the documentation for the game that comes with the game, like the little I'm just gonna say I talked to some people that were doing that side of it and they had the same problem. You know, they they, <laughs> they wrote all this stuff and then they have to throw it away because it's you know last minute change. Yeah. I believe yeah. it. Even something like changing up the a key map or something, and now you gotta yeah. redo this. Yeah. Yeah, and that would happen. And, and if you included like a, a key overlay or something with the game, which some games did, I mean, it'd be useless, right? You'd have to reprint it. And then that's, again, that's paper and time because it would take, my understanding was once the once the strat guide was finished, it, it was about two weeks 
to print it and bind it. And and there's there are complications with that too. If you ever look at a, you know about signatures in a book? If you ever look at a, like the editor, you can see there's these little one, two, three, four, five, six. They're, each one is called a signature and signatures are usually 16 pages. So they take eight pages, big oh. pages like this, and they fold them over. So they print them in a, in the proper way and then they, they fold them and then they glue them into the binding. So anytime you look at a book, you can actually see the signatures, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there's seven signatures in this book. Um, yeah, never, one, even, never noticed eight, that before. Yeah. So this is what you learn when you're in the business, right? So, uh, and, and so that's why, if you ever wonder why you get a book, and it'll have like four dedication pages, or it'll have two pages at the back that just say notes. This page, like, Why would you do this? It's because they always tried to, they would, when they laid the book out, they try to make it fit in a signature. So the signatures were either eight or 16 pages. And so, you know, if you, if you had uh, 32, 32 pages, which is four signatures of eight, right? Am I doing my math right? Then, but the book was 34 pages long then you have six empty pages right yeah, and there's was... nothing you could do, nothing you could do about it it's because they print on a, a long thing and then they fold it so it's basically like uh i guess it's like a piece of paper really right it's about the size of a piece of paper well, this one's got a couple of like uh advertisements and things but i often wondered yeah. about that when you have like seven pages worth of notes yeah I always thought, does people actually write in their books? Do they, does anybody actually write notes in those? But you know, sometimes just, you know what? somebody has uh, drawn some maps or something on those pages. So it's someone sitting around in a room saying, "How are we going to fill these pages?" <laughs> so, yeah, Bart, thanks for taking this time. It's been awesome. Yeah, well, I hope it was okay yeah, for you. Are, are there other stories that you know we might not? Is there anything we didn't get to that we should? um let me just have a look here there oh there's lots but you know as you can tell i'm a talker right so um Wait. how has the game industry started since okay how has the game industry changed since i started my career so i'm gonna cut the second half of that question with regard to game guides how has the game industry changed? Just my opinion, the game industry has become more corporate. And so it's made, there There are tight timelines and games have to come out in a particular quarter so that the corporate overlords can make the stock go up. And so I do believe that in some instances it has hurt game quality. Uh, in terms of quality, I mean, usually bugginess, like the, the details. Because, like I said at the beginning, that's what that's what uh, Blizzard was so great at is just ignoring all the outside noise and making sure the game was perfect before they shipped it. Yeah, right. That's what worries me about the future sometimes of the games industry. Because I, I feel, you know, I've heard the same, you know, things mm -hmm. several times from people, and it's just all games made by committees, basically, and all these metrics and focus groups and you know whatnot and. You know, they well, let's just do a sequel to this thing because it's already a well established uh, franchise. But yeah, you might they're like those games we were talking about with the the ones that Blizzard was doing, they're almost done. And then they said, well, let's scrap it. <laughs> I mean, there was some value though in that, right? I mean, they're experimenting, they're trying to find something innovative. Uh, well, I mean, uh, there's, there's, there's room, you got to have some room to fail, you know, if you really want to well, be. There's a whole school of thinking around that that uh, people that the people that kind of succeed the most are, are generalists who are allowed who allow themselves to fail mm -hmm. right uh there's a book about it called range actually by i can't remember who the who the author's name is but it's it's a really uh it's sort of david epstein but it's it's sort of you know the science of why you know uh very specific narrow learning isn't good so for for your technical writers be generalists because you never know what you're going into great to know I, there's a lot of technical writing needed for it yes 
but you never know what what you're going to get um in terms of you know what a company needs a technical writer for it could be it could be to populate or to write the text for for a an app on a phone or to or to you know sometimes they even want you to go sort of into the copywriter side and write write marketing stuff which i hate i don't do but um i'm not a great salesman so it's kind of niches that people might not think about like the thing one that gets brought up sometimes is the audio description Mm. you know for people that it's more than closed captioning you know they need yeah. people to describe uh yeah what, described uh audio right yeah you know. huge market for that you know and it takes a it does take i think some creativity to, to do that job i mean you're absolutely you to absolutely to do well yeah and i mean you get better at like i mean if i look at some of my early books they're probably full of passive voice right now when i see passive voice i just especially in business because it's passive used voice, passive voice was used <sighs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't even look. I don't want to know if there's passive voice in there. But um, you know, I, I, even like, uh, does this drive you nuts as a as a English professor? Like oh, the just the, well, like like so. Let me give you an example. So, I could be reading like a sport, an article about a sports team. Okay, let's say I don't like hockey, but even though I'm Canadian, but let's say it's hockey, right? And they're talking about a game that happened last night and they're talking about a particular player and they'll say, you know, Lanny McDonald would go on to score four goals. <laughs> and I mean, that's the, all, everything is written that way. All the newspapers, everything is in passive voice that way. And it's like, he, you know, he scored four goals. Just, just that's what happened. You know, past tense, like, he would go on like, and I think that, uh, I don't know what journalism schools teach, but I think that they think they're adding gravitas or something, but really they're just making it incredibly shitty. Yeah. I see yeah. that kind of thing all the time. I don't know if it's kind of just a colloquial thing that or an idiomatic thing. I don't know where people are getting that from. I do see it. I try to, <laughs> if it makes you feel better, I try to correct them. <laughs> you know, we've just got this. So, if you're writing, if you're trying to write a book for a real publisher, Random House, Pearson, Macmillan, Microsoft, um, it, it, I've written for all those guys. And let me tell you, Penguin, uh, well, it's Pearson now anyway. Um, but uh, you write something in passive voice, it's going straight in the circular file. <laughs> I'll pass that on. You know, it's kind of fun. I think I'm pretty sure I just covered that active and passive voice in a in a lesson a couple of maybe a week ago. It's always kind of tricky because a lot of students they just don't don't even know what you're talking about, right? Active and passive, and you know what? Well, it's lots it's, of examples, and I think right. once, you, once you see the examples, you know, the boy kicked the ball. And so on. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. I mean, like in business, passive you know, voice talking about it's rampant though right like yeah. in business uh, and because if you're writing an sop uh, standard operating procedure for something they'll say you know the it manager uh will inform hr that this person is no longer you know whatever and i can understand when you're writing that why you would think that because it's not happening right this moment it's in the future but you know it's it's a terrible way to write. You should it should just be the IT manager informs or must inform, mm -hmm. or it's required to inform. You know whatever, uh, rather than just they will. Uh, but there's some. I mean, that's not you know, a part too, of that. Is you know they'll say that some people will use the passive voice to. Well, I can't believe we're having this discussion. <laughs> but, but, you know, they try to cover up responsibility for something. So you wouldn't want to say the manager failed to, you know, get the deadline in a blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And so they'll just say, well, the deadline was not met. You know, so they don't have to put the name of the person that. Right. Know, on the, the deadline. So there is that side. There are uses for passive voice. And I occasionally. Oh, no, 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 no. We just. 
not not generally but that's just me i mean i just the, the longer i've been writing the better writer because i don't have an education like i went to university mm -hmm. um but i mean i was a nurse so i actually don't really have i don't have your knowledge i just have like as stephen king would say just i absorb right. the rules of the language i think you've won i see at least a hundred more books than i've ever <laughs> they're not real books After all that experience like that's your that's the one thing you hate is the passive voice i mean the most i could go on forever about stuff that i find irritating but... oh yeah 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 i bet <laughs> um, but anyway uh, i yeah. gotta go For this uh this week's episode hope you guys enjoyed that Whew, a little dust on the old drinking horn you know it's been too long when there is a little bit of dust on the old drinking horn we can't have that uh, but anyway thank you guys uh you know obviously there's been a, a little uh gap in between episodes the semester started here i'm teaching four classes <sighs> it's uh, it's been pretty hectic but you know i finally got some time was able to do this and thanks to matt bradley sure of course my assistant producer for helping me get in touch with bart and coming up with good questions and many other things so uh, thank you to matt and also thank you uh the patron <laughs> the retrons as it were thank you for supporting the show keeping it on the air keeping it in production keeping me well stocked with fine dwarven spirits uh, couldn't do this show would not do this show without you now, if for whatever reason you have decided not hitherto to proceed to that website linked so beautifully in the video uh, description uh, to a certain site called Patreon, I strongly encourage you to do so. You will really uh, like what happens. So you click the link a few minutes later, you're a Ratcheron. Uh, you can join the Discord. It's a really great community. You're going to have a really good time. And plus, you'll get a lot more out of the show because you'll be helping to make it. You'll be part of the team. Uh, so anyway, thanks to everybody who's done that already. Uh, and I really want you to as well, if you have not. So just pop on over there and do it. You can do it. <laughs> yes, you can do it. All right. What about that ale of the week? Uh, well, I was, uh, you know, shopping for potential ales and I came across this one. This is a Three Floyds. Let's see if I can get a shot of this box. The box really caught my eye. You know, it looks like it was designed for the uh, Borderlands game or something. Uh, really creative. I'm not sure what all is going on with this uh, packaging, but I thought I'd show you the box. Now, I, I thought I would drink all 12 of these uh, right here, just back to back. <laughs> no. Uh, but we'll see which one we uh, want to sample uh, for the old drinking horn. So let me uh, open her up here. And what do we got here? Gumball Head. American Wheat Pale Ale. This is a Three Floyds Brewing. It's not normal. Let's see, where are these guys from? Munster, Indiana, looks like. And, uh, you know, the lady that runs the store was telling me that these guys also make uh, Old Geezer or Foggy Geezer, something like that. Not sure if I've tried that one. Let's see what this says here. An American Wheat Ale brewed with white wheat and dry hopped with uh, hand-selected hops from the Yakima Valley. Bright and refreshing with a lemony finish. And 5.6% alcohol, so uh, not too bad. You know, I'm trying to <laughs> avoid the real heavy hitters, you know. And so this is probably about mid-range, which is just perfect. Anyway, you take a look through the can. I don't know how well you'll be able to see this. A little bit of a glare on it, but uh, it is pretty creative. Uh, but let's go ahead and pop it open, pour it in the drinking horn. Let's just... Uh, see what this is all about huh? okay yeah. you know i like cans cans are so much more convenient but uh, it is always fun to get the ones with the corks because then i could try to hit my camera sniff the glass you'll sniff test smells good i like to pour some in a glass so you can see what it looks like uh, so definitely looks like a wheat you know very uh nice gold color on that lots of bubbles i love that <laughs> you know there is nothing worse than a flat ale you know, i like a lot of bubbling action 
And we go for the rest here of my drinking horn. Gumball head. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a beer to me. Here, have a nice refreshing gumball head. Smell this. Woo, that smells good. You definitely smell the uh, the hops in there. I don't know, they say Yakima Valley hops, whatever. I'm not sure if that's also the name of the uh, type or just where the hops happen to be from. You know, some people actually grow their own hops. Uh, I've been looking into that. <laughs> it might be kind of fun. Uh, I don't know how well they'd grow here in Minnesota. But yeah, it's a nice uh, sort of peppery, citrusy uh, uh, aroma on that. It smells good. Let's go ahead and give this a go. Sometimes the wheaty, uh, the wheats aren't really hoppy. So I'm kind of curious about this uh, dry hopped uh, component of this one. Ah, oh, it's good. Uh, it is uh, what I would call refreshing. It's kind of a lighter taste. It's not real uh, heavy or <laughs> you know chocolatey or something like a stout would be. It's very light. Uh, not bitter at all. Uh, there's, I think, probably just about the right amount of hops to give it a little uh, uh, interest, I suppose, uh, when you're tasting it. They said it would be lemony. Uh, I don't, let me try it again. And I'm picking up a lemony finish. I guess maybe a little bit of a citrusy flavor, but it's probably more hoppy than anything. Let me try the glass, because sometimes, uh, for whatever reason, this glass gives you a different result. Yeah. So that, it tastes really good. You know, it's, it's hoppy. And, you know, it's not, if I didn't know this was a wheat ale, you know, and that's the only thing, I might not even realize this was a, a wheat ale. I'd just say this is probably an IPA. I'll try it again. Yeah, so I don't know if it's the dry hopped uh, component of this, but... You know, again, I would just have assumed, if I didn't know what this was, I'd probably think I was trying an, an IPA or maybe a, maybe an American pale ale, but it's not super weedy uh, that I would, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, drunk, drunk <laughs> plenty of those, uh, you know, like the wheat ales. Uh. So how to rate this? You know, I guess if you're looking for something that tastes like a traditional wheat ale, uh, you might want to pass on this because it's really more of a IPA flavor, but uh, it tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> just may, maybe not quite what you would expect. So, you know, I'd probably go somewhere between uh, maybe three and four out of five uh, drinking horns on that. Uh, definitely, definitely good. Maybe just not, you know, I kind of like the beer to taste like the thing it's supposed to be. But maybe that's just me. You know what? I think I got my stuff out of order. <laughs> I usually do the, uh, uh, the drinking horn bit last. Well, somehow I got mis mixed up. So, yeah, well, let's just hope that uh, it's not too strong because i got to get through my news segment. <laughs> yeah, so what about that news from the Matt Cave? I got too excited about the, uh, the Three Floyds of Variety Pack. I don't know. Okay, uh, first, off, uh, first up is uh, Snap Snapper wrote in with a link to Brandon Sheffield's article about the quote-unquote death of unity. All right, so what is happening with unity? You probably know more about it than I do. Apparently, they've rolled out some new changes to their business model, uh, some differences in the way they're going to be charging fees, uh, some licensing differences, subscription fee changes. Uh, and the argument is um, that these changes will make it harder on indie developers and small studios. Uh, so there's a lot of criticism about it. A lot of people saying that they have, uh, that the Unity people have lost their trust or they've lost confidence in this, this team, this company. Uh, they don't like the Unity's ability to change the pricing without notice and express concerns about monopolistic practices related to Unity. So it's just a big mess. <laughs> there's already people calling for boycotts. And, you know, I don't know if uh, Unity, you know, if they're going to be able to roll this back or or try to make things right somehow, but you know it's definitely a not a good look. You know, you just <laughs> you know you think they could have done this in a way that would, uh, you know, at least not ignite uh, undue controversy, right? I mean, surely there would have been a better way uh, to do this, or to find another way, maybe to make more money if that's what this is indeed all about, other than you know screwing or at least uh, you know making the your customer base feel like you're trying to screw them over. So. Uh, 
And if you've got more information about this, please let me know. Because <laughs> I am not a lawyer, and I don't, <clears throat> you know, I'm not a, a commercial game developer by any means. <laughs> and so I'd like to hear from you if you have a little bit more experience, a better take on that, what's going on with the Unity. Uh, it doesn't sound like there's much Unity at Unity. All right, next up, Tired Gaming Dad wrote in about Rogue Trader. Uh, this is a Warhammer 40,000 game, or 40K. Uh, they have an official release date trailer for this now. It will be uh, released on December 7th, just in time for Christmas. You know, this looks really cool to me. Uh, it looks like it'd be a nice alternative, something fresh. You know, I haven't done a lot of uh, gaming in the Warhammer universe, and so I'm really curious about this, eager to try it out. Uh, yeah, it's being done by Owlcat Games. So, so definitely a good crew. <laughs> you know, I, I see no reason why this couldn't be a really you know, awesome game, so... Keep tabs on that. And then finally, Miko Selva wrote in about Wizardry Proving Grounds of the Mad Overlord. That game has got a full 3D remake. And it's a, let's see, I'm pretty sure you know what Wizardry is, but it's the first, uh, the first party-based RPG video game. Is that right? Hmm. The first, well, party-based. You know, maybe... Uh, I'd probably want to double check that. Um, I know I wonder if that would include the you know, some of the public domain, some of the mainframe stuff, some of the stuff you <laughs> get on Play-Doh. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, probably one of the first. Uh, currently in early access for twenty-five dollars. A little bit of a sale going on. I think this is uh, five dollars off. So, so check that out. It's done by Digital Eclipse, and the trailer is pretty awesome. So definitely watch the trailer. All right, let's wrap it up with a quote. And I was looking uh, for quotes about technical writing and that sort of thing. Uh, and I found one by Suyag Ketkar, who wrote a book called The Right Stride. I was actually looking up, looking up this book, reading a little bit about it. And it looks like it might be worth reading, too. And at least if this quote is anything to go by. Anyway, the quote goes something like this. Users notice good design only when it is missing. Seems right. <laughs> anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time.